So I want to share something I do in my other job, which is uh, training. Uh, I'm going to show you slides based on uh, some work by Dave Abrahams. He showed me this, uh, what I'm about to show you, on copy elision and return value optimization. And it totally opened my eyes about that, because I knew what those were. And, but I was always a little dubious, like, how do I know the compiler can really do that? I was, yeah, OK, people talk about it, and I just didn't believe it. I didn't. So he, he showed how it works, which I'm about to show you in a minute. And I was like astounded. It's like, that makes so much sense. I now, now I get it. And so I'm going to show it to you, and I, I hope you appreciate it. But, but Dave wasn't that, wasn't that happy. He's, I said, these are just amazing. He said, no, they're not really right. I said, what? These are great. He says, they're not so great. What are you talking about? I, I, I learned something from this that, that I will remember forever. And he said, well, yeah, but technically they're not correct because of this and this. So I said, well, fine. I fixed them. So this is my fixed version. But all the credit goes to Dave. The real work was Dave's. Really inspiration. So copy elision is, is based on the fact that the compiler is allowed to follow the as-if rule, which is the compiler is allowed to generate any code that has the, the, the same effect as the code you told it to write. Compiler put things in different order to all sorts of things. But um, there's an addition in the standard. The standard actually says that if, if the compiler is told to copy something, but the copy is not really necessary because the original isn't going to be used again, the compiler is allowed to elide that copy. And you can tell if they've done that if your copy constructor has side effects. And the standard specifically says that your side effects won't happen. The compiler is allowed to elide those. But we, we're not going to show you how and why this happens. First thing I want to ask you, though, is this, this function f. How many parameters does it take? OK, so some people here are C++ programmers, and they're all saying 0. And some people are assembly language programmers, and they're all saying 1. <laughs> the C++ programmers say none. But assembly language programmers say one. Why? What is the the return value? We at the low level, when we have a return value, we have to tell the generated code where to put the return value. So, uh, so that's the function is passing that address. All right. So this is what's going on. Our our function g is going to call our function f in order to uh, populate a local. So here's our stack frame for g. No parameters passed in, but it but it has a local x. Now we're going to call f. And when we call f, we're going to have to create the stack frame for f, which has a parameter. What's the parameter? The, the address of the return value, which in this case is the address of x, right? OK. Now we execute f. And so we create our a value and our b value. And now we do the return. And of course, the return is going to copy a into the address where it's copied. Does everybody see how that happens? Does that make sense? And this is how your code is written if your compiler engineer is a complete and total moron. <laughs> but your compiler engineer is not a complete and total moron. What's the problem with this? You, you've created something only to turn around and copy it. So that's not how this is actually going to work. How is this actually going to work? What's going to happen is this. When we call f, we're going to create the stack frame from f, which isn't going to have any place for a. Why? Because we're going to create a where it's eventually supposed to be copied to, but we're going to elide the copy, right? Uh, so this is, this is the return value optimization. So in this situation here, G, can we use the return value optimization here? No. Why? Because the whole point of the return value optimization is that the compiler creates the object to be returned in the place where it's going to be returned. The, the compiler can only do that if it knows which object will be returned. And at compile time, it can't know which object is going to be returned. Only at runtime can it know that. Um, so uh, this is another situation, just slightly different. OK, so this can also work on parameters passed in. So in this case, we're passing in a temporary to f. And so when we create the temporary there, and then we call, uh, call f and pass it into the, the stack for f. And again, this is how your code would be written if your compiler engineer is a moron, which he's not, or she is not, excuse me. Um, so this is how it actually works. We are going to create our temporary in the place where we would have copied it. The compiler has to create a temporary. It does it here. Now, of course, as you notice, this would not work with an L value. This works only for temporaries. But in the case of temporaries, we can actually completely avoid the copy by simply doing this in place. Uh, I hope that uh, gives you some idea about how this copy illusion is actually implemented at the low level. And I will say that for me personally, Understanding that made all the difference in understanding RVO and copy elision. Thank you very much.